it's a Wednesday night and the Lord brought us great rain today. Hopefully your yard got watered. You guys noticed the new monkey bars we installed in the house of the Lord. So we have a little playground going there and I'll be preaching from the third level here just in a little bit. So no, we're in the process of doing some upgrades. We're gonna have some new cameras installed this week and we've got new speakers in the foyer, and the outside of the portico in the hall in the, all the rooms and it's uh, just a little upgrade so that our ushers and staff and then this past Sunday uh, would have been a great blessing to have that but we we the, the ushers count was about 452 Sunday and we probably had uh, a little bit more than that between 400 and a thousand people were here <laughs> and uh, I'm just first of all thank you it was it's, there were 15 children being dedicated and the uh, the level of love of, of excellence that you exhibited caring for all these guests many of the people that came were here obviously because they're grandchildren or children and uh, they weren't here looking for a church but many of them are just being exposed to it and uh, it was just an amazing amazing Sunday so give yourselves a hand thank you thank you for helping me what what did we talk about Sundays anybody remember the message child protective services what were the what were the prime is anybody remember what, what 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 is it that we as parents are supposed to protect for our children their faith yes and their and their innocence that's two simple points it's easy if you weren't here go back and watch the message um, and I did get a chance to talk to a few of the parents whose children were dedicated and ever since then the kids they're not more anointed but they're more annoying so I don't know what happened I'm sorry about that but Brother Atticus is not having a great time and, and others, so I don't know if we can undo what we did. I don't think so. Uh, but obviously, the dedicating of children really has nothing to do with the child's salvation directly, but indirectly it does because it is a statement by the family that we are committing to raise this child in the fear and admonition of the Lord. It was a great opportunity to bless and to minister. Uh, we have a leadership workshop this Sunday and excuse me this Saturday uh, brother Josh Malonso and his wife are going to be here and if you attend leadership on Sunday mornings you are invited and uh, it'll, if, if you're just here and you're like you know what I'm interested in, in growing and maturing I'm just gonna open it up to you and uh, it's gonna begin at 9 o'clock Sunday uh, Saturday morning and then coming October the 1st I'm gonna be talking about this in the message tonight but uh, I have been praying in earnest about going to a two-service format we have to figure out how to handle what God has blessed us with. And uh, right now, we, we're not able to expand this current building for more seating for the sanctuary. We are building this next phase here for our children, and we desperately need that. And once that's completed, then we can begin on phase three. But until then, we do not want to plateau. We want to continue to grow. And the way to do that is through two services. That's going to begin October the 1st. There'll be two services on that Sunday, 9 a.m., and 11 a.m. and the most anointed service will be at the 11 a.m. 9 a.m. I'm just a, going to run through but 11, I'm picking they're both going to be fantastic and I'm going to go back and forth telling you which one is going to be my favorite but it, I'm going to talk a little bit about that in the message but I just want to put that in your mind if you're watching right now you'll have two opportunities on Sunday to come and be a part of the service we're only going to live stream the second service we're not going to live stream the first service we're going to live stream the second service but all the services are going to be recorded both video wise as well as audio Father in the name of Jesus Christ thank you today thank you for your goodness and mercy thank you for the rain we know, Lord, that the only climate control, the only person that's controlling the climate, the weather, is you. It's in your hands. We're grateful for the rain. We're grateful for your blessings. Thank you for your great mercy. Cleanse us of every sin. Wash us of every iniquity. If there's anything in our hearts that would separate us from you, we ask forgiveness. And I pray that today, God, you would bless your people. May there be an anointing in this house to teach the word, to impart biblical principles. May there be change, not just a touch, but a change. Draw us near you, O oh God. I pray anointing over our South Campus, Brother Charles Gocho and our student ministry. I ask God that you would impart to those young ladies and young men passion, confidence, and boldness to stand for you and to live righteously and godly in this present world. And then in this house tonight, I pray the same in Jesus' name. And everyone said amen. Would you clap your hands to the Lord?
Let's worship him together in song in Jesus' name.
everything to you master nothing's hidden nothing's off limits i give you access to every area of my life god convict me correct me lead me direct me i'm worthy i'm yours i'm yours i worship you father i worship you with all my heart i worship you with all my heart in jesus name thank you father thank you lord thank you lord thank you father master you are free to move to bless to heal tear down every barrier God if there's anything inhibiting you in our lives in the name of Jesus in the name of Jesus make bare your holy arm thank you God thank you God thank you God thank you Savior thank you Savior I love you Lord thank you Father thank you Lord thank you Lord thank you Lord reach across grab a neighbor by the hand let's pray one for another in the name of Jesus Christ, I bless my brother. I bless my sister right now. Father, I pray I pray your favor over them. I ask that you would strengthen their faith. I speak your peace over their mind and their spirit. If they're hurting in their body, I pray healing over them right now in the name of Jesus. Anything that is threatening their peace, that's bringing anxiety or fear, keeping them up at night, God, occupying their mind, may the peace that passes understanding, may it overwhelm them in the name of Jesus Christ. I bless them. I bless them in the name of Jesus Christ. And everyone said amen. Amen. One more time. Clap your hands to the Lord. I want to take a moment to uh, publicly thank a person who is rarely ever seen but much of what takes place in our church is dependent upon him and that is brother Dustin Mallett brother Dustin sits in that cage and has to every time he comes to church he's never allowed to be out here and he, he plays those drums and he's quite good at it you know what? This brings an opportunity. Uh, there, there needs to be men and women following these people. There needs to be other drummers here, other bass players here, other guitar players here, other singers here. Our student ministry, our youth ministry is a breeding ground for this. We're trying to replicate this and be a generational church where there's layers of people. And uh, so if there's an interest in you, if you have, well, I, you know, I, I like to play the drums one day. Well, you know what? Uh, maybe you can ask your grandparents to buy your drums because your parents probably won't, but <laughs> for a myriad of reasons. 
first and foremost is being the noise factor, but uh, I appreciate Brother Dustin, and he also takes care of editing my radio broadcast each week, so that takes away a few hours of labor that I have to do. He does that for me, and he also does videography for the church, among other things. So Brother Dustin, we appreciate you. Thank you. We love you very much. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, received my first official bid today for construction uh, that gets us in the next phase here next week I'll be receiving another one on the 18th and uh, so we are having to start selecting colors for the floors for the counter surfaces uh, for the halls for the rooms we got to pick paint colors for the all that stuff so we're in that phase so that's exciting uh, that is going to be happening in the very near future and I'm very very excited about it Thank you for giving. Thank you for uh, returning to the Lord, your tithe, your offering. Um, it's, we, we can't do this without it. Thank you. It, really, honestly, whenever he gets a hold of your heart, that's the least of your issues. You just trust him with it. And you learn, you learn over time. To, it's a trust issue. It's not a money issue. And I just want to challenge you to trust God with your finances. And the way you ensure his blessings over that particular area is by tithing. Whenever you set aside 10% of your income, as his word teaches, you are asking God to bless your finances. He said, if you will do this in, Math, in Malachi chapter 4, if you will do this, I will pour out the blessings. I will rebuke the devourer on you, over you. So that's a biblical principle that my wife and I have followed before we ever received income from that. We did this as Christians, not as ministry team, but as Christians. And uh, the vast majority of you do that. I'm, I'm challenging maybe those who are new here, maybe young people that think, well, you know what, my $10, what difference does it make? It's not uh, that your $10 makes a difference. It's the difference that God makes in your life by appointing that to him and assigning that to him. Thank you. So in the name of Jesus Christ, Father, we just thank you. All that we have is a gift from you. Every benefit, every increase, everything, our breath, our breath comes from you. And thank you for giving us the ability to earn an income. I speak blessings over men and women, God, who return to you any portion. But those who accept the challenge to return the tithe, may you just show yourself strong on their behalf. Comfort them, give them wisdom. Those who might be a little intimidated or a little fearful, would you just give them comfort and direction and, and uh, bless them for this sacrifice? I, I honor you in this special way in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. You can return your tithe and offering to the storehouse of the Lord. You can text to give. That number's on the screen. Uh, kiosk is in the back if you'd like to give that way. Children, you can be dismissed to your class. Wednesday night and then we will probably have special services where we all come together again which would be fun whenever there's you know 300 in one service and 275 in the other service where are you going to put 575 people well that's why we have the monkey bars back there so we're going to put scaffolding all along there and we'll put all the young people on the scaffolding that'll be our second floor why don't you stand with me I'm reading from the book of Isaiah chapter 20 I feel like I have a message for you tonight it it's some teaching and some preaching and as I'm looking at this word that the Lord gave me, um, I know how enough to know how God works. I'm going to be speaking to you from a subject, and he is going to speak some things to you. And you're going to hear things in your spirit that maybe I don't even say. That's probably the most important part, is that you're here, and your spirit is open to the word of God. 
And often people will come to me afterwards and say, oh, pastor, I love when you said da-da-da. And I'm telling you, I don't remember saying it. And probably I could go back and prove I didn't say it. But that's what they heard. And, and they're not lying. It's just that's what they heard. And that's what's important about being together in, in the corporate body. God speaks to us through his word. Um, if you were to put the Bible to video, there are several chapters that you would, you'd have to rate, either rated X or NC-17 or whatever it is, or rated R. And um, my text today, if I had visuals on the screen, would probably be inappropriate. Isaiah chapter 20, verse 1. In the year that Tartan came unto Ashdod, when Sargon, the king of Assyria, sent him and fought against Ashdod and took it, at the same time spake the Lord by Isaiah, the son of Amos, saying, Go and loose the sackcloth from off thy loins and put off thy shoe from thy foot. And he did so walking naked and barefoot. And the Lord said, like as my servant Isaiah hath walked naked and barefoot three years. Well, why? Why? Here's why. For a sign. Now, I'm thinking, okay, it's bad enough to be asked to do something like this, but could we do it maybe for a week? Three days? I'd barter with God. Maybe a day, okay? I'm, I'm streaking for a day. No, you're going to do this for three years. It's debatable what exactly is meaning. Theologians say, well, buttocks were exposed. I, I don't know, but it says he went around naked and barefoot. You can interpret that however you want. Do your own research. Whatever it means, it does not mean he walked around completely clothed and everybody thought he was a normal guy. Something was missing. He said, you're going to do this for three years for a sign and a wonder upon Egypt and upon Ethiopia. So shall the king of Assyria lead away the Egyptian prisoner. So he's, he's using this as saying this is what's going to happen. And the Ethiopian captives, he's pronouncing judgment. Young and old, naked and barefoot, even with their buttocks uncovered. So that at minimum, at minimum, Isaiah's buttocks were uncovered. That's a, that's a pretty tall order. Can you imagine praying and you hear the voice of the Lord say, you're going to say, I got to have a witness, Lord. <laughs> right. I need a witness. I need two or three witnesses or something. What, what if it wasn't, what if he just spoke audibly to you? You're like, I'm losing my mind. You're thinking, I want the Lord to speak to me. And the first time he speaks to you, he says something like this to you. And so I know God's trying to give a message to the Ethiopians and to the Egyptians and show himself strong on behalf of Israel. But to me, the issue is poor Isaiah. Isaiah was asked to do a very hard thing. I want to speak to you on this subject. Hard things are the Lord's things. And now, in my spirit, whenever I heard myself read this text before I read it to you, I know some of you already have a word from the Lord. He is already working on you because right now you're in the midst of a hard thing. And the Lord has a word for you tonight. Hard things are the Lord's things. And you don't have to understand them. You don't have to agree with them. You don't have to like them. I don't think Isaiah went, whoo-hoo. I don't think Isaiah went around celebrating. I think Isaiah was in a, a three-year funk. Right? He was in a three-year moratorium on dignity. His, his dignity was stripped. and Why? Because God will use us to do things. And so if, if we get caught up in the trees, we, we can't see the forest. If we get caught up in time, we, we lose sight of eternity. If we get caught up in the temporal, we lose sight of the eternal. If we get caught up in the, in the 
bitter, we, we lose sight of the sweet by and by. Hard things are the Lord's things. Father, in the name of Jesus, would you help me? And thank you for, for speaking to my heart. I pray that you would help me to say the things that need to be said to the people who are here, those who are watching or listening. In the name of the Lord Jesus, I plead your blood. I ask that you would melt hearts and that you would give wisdom and insight into each individual's own story. In Jesus' name, I pray. And everyone said amen. amen. Clap your hands to the Lord. <laughs> Look at your neighbor and say, hard things are the Lord's things. You may be seated. God asked Isaiah to do this hard thing simply to illustrate his intentions. The earth is filled with hard things. For instance, titanium. It's the new, uh, it's the new element. It's the new product of Apple with their new iPhone. It's being, it's being produced with a shell of titanium. Titanium is the hardest naturally occurring metal. And sapphire is, is another very hard thing. It's used in the production of crystals, on higher-end Swiss watches, the, the watch I'm wearing isn't a higher-end Swiss watch. It's actually a lower-end, cheap Chinese knockoff of a higher-end Swiss watch. This is a $150 watch based off of a $4,000 watch. But this little $150 watch has a sapphire crystal. And sapphire crystals are very scratch-resistant. They're hard. In fact, sapphire jewels are used also in mechanical watches to hold and support metal parts and reduce friction. So if you ever see a watch and it says 20 jewels and you're like, I don't see any diamonds, that is not what it's talking about. The jewels are the sapphire settings where little gears and little pivots are setting, like in the image, to prevent friction and wear. Your lawnmower has blades that are made of iron or steel or some composite of them. And the mower would be ineffective if the blades weren't harder than the blades of grass needing to be mowed. The Lord uses hard things. <clears throat> hard things are the Lord's things. Ministry is hard work. And I am not talking about what I do. It's very easy for, there, there is no way God designed this for a man or woman to stand up here hoping to create pastors of all people. That is not the intent. The intent is to create disciples. That's really the job. I'm a discipler. My job is to convince you of his goodness and mercy and to convey biblical principles in an attempt to convert you and to have convictions be present, to get you to do ministry. But ministry is hard work. Two letters in the word work are W and O, and whenever you reverse them, it spells ow. Ow. Ministry is hard work. The problem in today's job market is that too many people want a paycheck but really don't want to work. Yep, I was like, yeah, you know them. What's their names? Go ahead and say. No, don't do that. The problem in today's church is that too many people want a position or a title but really don't want to do ministry because ministry is hard work. It really is. No, it, it's, it's not the grind of digging a ditch with a shovel or building a levee with a shovel in a rice field. That, that's not really what it is. It, it's the inconvenience that constantly inserts itself into your life when ministry calls. Because ministry is almost always dealing with other people. And people are messy, aren't we? Mm -hmm. You see, too many of us just want to be left alone. And with that attitude, we very well may get what we want. When the rapture takes place, you may be left alone P preacher just preach your sermon and leave me alone this is not that church <laughs> this is not a religious entertainment venue you can go to a comedy club you can go to church well we in in include comedy but this cannot become a religious gathering it it, it, it must be an active word-fed spirit-led church where disciples are being made, where people are being convinced of Jesus Christ and his kingdom. 
They're not joining a religion. Their life is being converted from what they were to what he wants them to be. All things are passed away. All things become new. You are a new creature, a new creation. Can I have an amen? In Mark 10 and 45, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give. See, that's what serving is. It's giving. What I'm doing is I'm giving you the path to fulfillment and joy. And it's always going to focus on others. The most miserable you will become is whenever you focus on yourself and your problems. Whenever you become myopic, when you become a navel gazer, when all of a sudden all you can see is yourself and your problems. Look at you. Look at, look at your marriage. Look at your double chin. Look at your receding hairline. Just look at it. Look at your feet. you got the ugliest feet. See, all these little things the enemy does because we see others on social media, we compare ourselves. And, and who in this room can measure up to any of those standards? Who in here has the 10 life, right? You, you, you are a 10 in every way. In your looks, in, in, in your education, in your income, in your Christianity. Who is that person? They're not in this room. And so if I'm not careful, I can just focus on all that is wrong. And I can become so self-absorbed that I forget why God put me on this earth. It was for others who goeth a warfare at any time at his own charges, Paul says. The reason this is in the scriptures is because it's answering the question when someone asks, well, what about me? When do I get my needs met? You're always talking, Pastor, you got to give it together. Well, I want to know when I'm going to get mine. When am I going to get to come and receive? Watch this. Who goeth a warfare anytime at his own charge? Who is this that goes war? Who planteth a vineyard and eateth not the fruit thereof? Or who feedeth the flock and eateth not of the milk of the flock? Are you seeing this? It's when you go to war, you get paid. It's when you plant a vineyard, you get to eat or drink. It's when you feed the flock, you get something. In other words, you do and you receive from that. It's easy to adopt the cultural mindset as I receive by virtue of I'm entitled to it. I exist. I was born. Where's my check? I am here. I showed up. Now you deserve, I, you owe me. No, 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 no. You have to earn this. It is written in the law of Moses. Thou shalt not muzzle the mock, the mouth, the mocks, the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. Doth God take care for oxen? What he's saying, it's rhetorical. Of course he does, but he does in this context because whoever it is that's put a yoke on the ox is going to feed the ox from the very corn that the ox is treading out. And this is a reference to ministry also. Yes, it applies to a pastor, but it has a spiritual application to the believer also. Do you not know that they which minister about holy things live of the holy things of the temple? I'm trying to tell you, as you teach Bible studies, as you reach the lost, God begins to put back into you. Is that true, Tyreek? Can I have an amen, Tyreek? Sunday before last, we had nobody get the Holy Ghost. Sunday before last, we had nobody baptized, at least in church. But about two hours after church, Tyreek taught a Bible study to three of his friends and when we got a phone call, we had to come back and baptize three of those men on a Sunday after church. Young lady drove from Baton Rouge, came to church. Then a couple hours after the baptism, was at the house, I think at Silk and Knives or wherever. And they got their own little outreach going over here. And then she received the Holy Ghost that night in their home. Listen, this, there's, a, there's a reason you're being fought. But there's also a reason for the great fulfillment. This is the key. It's, it's not for new converts. It's not for new people. It's for anybody who finally picks it up and realizes, oh, this is how I remain fruitful and on fire for God. I don't want my passion for God to wane. I don't want to become a mannequin in the house of God. I don't want to become a SpongeBob SquarePants who comes to church and absorbs ministry and leaves the same as they came. Whenever I first became pastor, I had an aversion to Pentecostals. 
So we were reaching a bunch of people. We are just reaching new people. And so a Pentecostal family would move into town, and they would, they would say, Pastor, Pastor, so-and-so is here, and this, this guy is great, and he's a mechanical engineer. You're going to like, oh, thank you, Jesus. And I go meet the guy, and then I find out that he is from another church like ours. <sighs> and so I would say this. I said, hey, man, if you're looking for a church, a good church that's going to bless you and bless your family and bless your, your, you with, with great ministry, this ain't the place for you. But if you're looking for a church where you're going to be challenged to make a contribution to the kingdom, where you're not going to be comfortable sitting on a pew absorbing ministry, you might want to be here. Bye-bye. He left before service was over, and so did about 95% of everybody else. <laughs> that was my line. Maybe that was wrong, but I just, I'm, not, I'm not after that. These people are already saved. I, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to recruit people who, who want to reach the lost. I'm not trying to run off anybody. I, I, I'm really not. And maybe that was a little too crass. But he is looking for people who are just hungry. And it's easy to get in church and figure it out and just become a member. A dead, dry member who over time becomes carnal and finally divisive. And all the divisive people said amen. Thank you, sister. Thank you. I'm just picking See, you and I have been given a perpetual spring, an infinite source of life. In Isaiah 28 and 11, it says, with stammering lips and another tongue, will he speak to this people? It's a reference to the baptism of the Holy Ghost to come a few thousand or several hundred years later. And then it says in verse 12, to whom he said, this is the rest wherewith you may cause the weary to rest. And this is the refreshing, our rest, our refreshing came when God filled us with the Holy Ghost. Receiving the Holy Ghost isn't for the purpose of you getting a certificate that's orange or purple, whatever that color is. I don't even remember. The baptism of the Holy Ghost isn't just for resurrecting you from the grave. It's also for giving you resurrection power every day. The Holy Ghost resurrects you out of the doldrums, out of the pits of depression and discouragement. After watching the news, who doesn't have the blues? Right? Whatever's going on, okay, my peace can't be based on the political climate. My peace can't be placed on, be based on the mortgage interest rates. My peace can't be based on what, what's approved and not approved in the public school system, who's honoring their oath of office, who isn't. It doesn't matter that this particular governor in this particular state has stated out loud that nothing is absolute, not even my oath to the Constitution. That was this past week. That kind of stuff. It's insane. So I can't let those things consume me. I, I've got to be able to go to bed tonight and have some peace. Amen? If you have children, that's not for you. That's just for us old people who don't have children anymore. No peace for you. No soup for you. No peace for you. No sleep for you. In Acts chapter 3, verse 19, he said, repent. Therefore, and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped away. The, uh, that's in the NRSV, the, the New Revised Standard Version. In verse 20 says, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Listen, that verse is talking about you being in the, it's talking to people already converted. Whenever you and I come to the house of God, there is a refreshing that takes place here that makes you feel what you first felt. I, I've talked to you about your faith and your feelings, that your feelings are the greatest enemy of your faith. If you keep feeding your faith, your faith will defeat your feelings. When you repent of your sins, when your faith isn't strong, when you repent of your sins, you may not feel forgiven. And so as you feed your faith, you learn not to trust your feelings. I don't have to feel forgiven to be forgiven. You got it? But that only happens if you feed your faith. But over time, you and I, we're human beings. I need to feel God. He's talking about the times of refreshing. They come from the presence of the Lord. And he said, where two or three are gathered in my midst, in my name, I'll be there in the midst. That refreshing comes. That's why we come together so we can gather. Can I have an amen? And that refreshing, you need to be in that. God replenishes us when we get together. And everybody said amen. It's possible to be strong and weak at the same time. Let me explain. Strong people can do things that only strong people can do. But their weakness surfaces when what's required of them doesn't require strength. 
It requires tenacity. A perfect illustration of this would be the arm wrestler. I've always enjoyed arm wrestling. I'm not good at it, but it just always intrigued me. And if you go online and you watch YouTube videos of arm wrestlers, there's some guys that are amazingly strong that don't look strong at all. And they'll go into gyms, and there's these massive bodybuilders. I mean, they're, they're biceps. I mean, it, they're not quite as big as mine, but they're close. And, and I mean, these guys, it's, it's, it's insane. And you see that bodybuilder put his elbow on the table, and this schoolboy who looks like he's 17 years old with circular glasses, kind of a Harry Potter look, he just smiles and looks at the guy. And so it starts, and the guy with the circular glasses just looks at the guy, and, and the muscular, and then veins are both, and the guy with the little arm, and he's just standing there. And he's just smiling. And he does it for about 40 seconds or so. And then he just looks at the guy and smiles and does like this with his wrist and puts your shoulder in and just goes. See, the guy with the muscles was strong, but he had a weakness. He did not have stamina. He did not have tenacity. He did not work these particular muscles. And I'm telling you that there's something to be said about stamina. Your, your stamina is your ability to hang in there. It, God, God doesn't need people with great faith. He just needs people that have faith that's tenacious. It sticks. See, tenacity is important. The strong often become weak when the task requires tenacity. Tenacity is the ability to continue when it gets hard. What do you do when it gets hard? Get drunk. What do you do when it gets hard? Quit. What do you do when it gets hard? Well, it gets hard for everybody. And if you think that you, you projected, okay, well, movie stars, well, it doesn't matter who you're talking about. They all have their problems. It's hard for everybody. I don't care what the... TikTok dude is promoting. I'm telling you, they all, we all have a human condition that no amount of money, no amount of success, no amount of fame satisfies. None of it. You, you, it doesn't matter how much you get. You'll always want more. You, you have to learn to be content. There's all kinds of issues. There's physical problems. Being a celebrity doesn't exempt you from catching a, a disease or having cancer. All this stuff, being fabulously wealthy, it, it's, it's the human condition and, and so what do I do? My faith must be a tenacious faith. It carries me through hard things. The word hard means requiring great effort, difficult to resolve. What do you do when it gets hard? Because hard is a large part of kingdom business. Don't quit when it gets hard. Marriage is hard. I am telling you, marriage is hard. All of you who don't think marriage is hard, you can get up and leave right now. No, I'm pick, don't leave. It's hard. It's not going to be hard for me. We're in love. I've heard people say the silliest things. We haven't fought in the first, the first five years. I'm like. Whatever. You married someone with mental issues. There's no way. And it, it, there's just no way. It's just retarded. Say those things. Church can be hard. Church can be hard. Don't quit. You, you get hurt by someone here. How are you supposed to go to church with them? They're sitting over here and they owe you money. They're over here and they said something ugly to you outside. Matter of fact, they said it in the parking lot. How are you supposed to worship God with them in this house? Let me explain something to you. When you die, you're going to face your Savior alone, all by yourself. You will not have your mate. You will not be a mother or a father. The Lamb's Book of Life, there are names written in the Lamb's Book of Life with no prefix, no suffix. There will not be a REV period in front of my name in the Lamb's Book of Life. There is no Ph.D. master's degree. I don't have either. But if I did, that wouldn't follow my name. Whosoever's name was not found written. Not title, not position. I will not be a father in heaven. I will not be a son in heaven. I will not be a, a husband in heaven. We become a part of the bride of Christ. You are going to stand alone. Do not make decisions based on him or her, based on a temporary situation that has an eternal consequence. Your marriage is temporary. Your relationship is temporary. 
Well, until death is due part. Shout, you're going to depart, and then it's temporary. It's not forever. He's not going to love you forever. You won't be able to talk to him. There's no knowledge in the grave whither thou goest. That's the Bible. He is not talking to you from the grave. That's demonic. That's head games. How do you know that, Pastor? Because the word says so. The, you, you, the, the Bible corrects all these crazy, superstitious things that people say. I know he's looking down right now. No, him not. He is not looking down because there's no pain, there's no sorrow, there's no tears up there. How can he look at your current situation and not feel some sorrow whenever you go through issues, right? I, people just say these things, and I get it. We just say these words to come. Listen, life can be hard. Don't quit. Church can be hard. Don't quit. Parenting can be hard. Don't quit. Don't quit when it gets hard. P putting up for your financial future. That's hard. Don't quit because your finances are in a jam. Hang in there. I mean, for the first two decades of our marriage, my girls, I've told them this, they are better off in the first three years of their marriage than Paul and I were in the first 20 years of our marriage. That's a fact. But that's the way it's supposed to be. You're supposed to want your children to do better than you, aren't you? If you don't, there's something wrong with you. Whatever you're going through, it's temporary. Your bills are all going to get paid one way or the other. Maybe after you die, but they're going to get paid. Or they're going to get dismissed. It's all temporary, but your soul, that's eternal. Yeah, you don't quit when it gets hard. Ministry can be hard. Going to two services, that's going to be hard. It's going to be hard for some people. Don't quit when it gets hard. See, the word tenacious means holding on or, or, or tending to hold persistently to something, such as a, as, as a point of collateral or whatever. Holding together firmly, cohesive, clinging to another object. I have, I've got to be. The Lord helped me go through hard things. When we built the church in 2015, and, uh, man, I know I'm running short on time, and I'm not even close to what I want to get to, so just bear with me on this. Um, this was hard. We, we, we didn't have any money when we started. We didn't. I had to borrow a million dollars. A million dollars. Like Thurston Howell the third was a million. What's a million dollars? That's a thousand thousand dollars. Well, who has a million? I've never seen a million dollars. Oh my God, it makes me nervous and sick to my stomach to think that I have to borrow when I had to sign the papers for a million dollars. Oh God. We, we, we had about $1,400 in our account. But when we did the paperwork, we had a, a fund that we showed, and it was the um, CLRF fund, the Clifton Lejeune Retirement Fund. <laughs> and so I had about $70,000 in my retirement account back then. And so we were able to show that because worst case scenario, then I would use that money for whatever the church needed. And so I was able to show that. And I look at where we are now. I'm so grateful, but I know what it's like to go through hard, difficult times. That was hard. It was hard when all the banks in town would not give us a loan. All of the lending is nobody. Nobody would loan us money. It was, it was hard. And then once we got the money and got started, contractors, it was just a bad, it was a bad, bad. It was rough. It was difficult. It was hard. But it didn't quit. And now, look at where we are. Look at what God's done. And so some of you, all you know is this. You don't know the previous 27 years it took to get here. You take a screenshot of our life and of our church or my family, and, whoa, I want that. Well, there's something that happened before that. It's going through hard times, staying, remaining faithful, trusting God regardless of what I feel, of what I see. I just know I've heard from God. I don't know why this isn't working out. I don't know why this isn't, I don't know. It hurts and, and he's mad and she's mad and, and I'm being sued. I'm being threatened. They, they, it was so bad. I signed a $27,000 contract for our plumbing for this building in 2015. When it was all done, I got a bill for $25,000 more. I just dismissed it. I'm like, whatever, we already paid twenty nine grand. And so the guy said, no, 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 you owe me another 25. I'm like, how do you figure? And he produced an invoice. Well, the first contract I signed for 27000 But he had a contract that I did not sign where they added 25 more thousand. What am I supposed to do with this? Further, 
he told his men that they're not getting a Christmas bonus because a preacher in Jennings, a Pentecostal preacher in Jennings, won't pay his bills. They went to a Pentecostal church in Texas, told their pastor what kind of dirt bag is in Jennings. He began to talk to his pastor friends. His pastor friends contacted my superintendent. My superintendent calls me and wants to know why I'm not paying my bills. You, I haven't told all these stories, but they're there. There's many more. What am I supposed to do with this? These are hard times. It was a lie. It was unfair. And it, it was real money. We were tapped out. We had no more. Do you understand what it means to have no more money? Do you? Well, they don't. Because now I have to come up with the money some kind of way. Are they going to place a lien on the church? Which means if we get any money at all given to us, if we win anything, it goes to them first. And then our records are besmirched in the community for not paying our bills. So I contacted law firms. What can I do? And they said, the best thing you can do is settle. I'm like, how can I settle? I don't owe this guy. I paid him 2000 over the contract already. The contract was for 27 I wrote 29 How can I owe him another 25 we were on vacation, and it was just eating on me. This was something, I mean, it's just, it's just, it's just a constant because it's on you. You know how it is when you got that kind of weight. I got the weight of my own house, my own bills, and then the weight of it. All this, these are hard things. So finally, I called and said, what can we do? And, he, and uh, I offered a number, and he came back, and he said, I'll settle for 15000 Now, I've already paid twenty nine on a $27,000 contract. So where does the 15000 come from? We don't have 15000 I had about 20000 in my savings account. So I pulled 15000 out of my savings account and paid that dude, and you guys paid me back five years later because we didn't have the money. I'm not saying that to garner pity. I'm trying to help you understand. I've gone through hard times, and God did things in me through those hard things. Hard things are the Lord's things. It's not all Satan. He permits things. He permits Satan to attack. He permits sickness and disease. He permits some things. I can't answer all your questions. I don't understand how it all works. I just ascribe it to the Lord. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not into thine own understanding. In all thy ways, acknowledge him. I don't care if I'm right or wrong. I'm just trusting the Lord with it. Well, that's just dumb. Well, fine. I hope it works out for you, but I'm trusting God with it. With the good, the bad, and the ugly... I have no ill will. Well, what happened, Pastor? Well, we got burned for over a hundred thousand dollars. It's like somebody, it's like you saving up a hundred grand or borrowing a million and taking a hundred of that million and just setting it on fire. Psh, how's that feel? <gasps> you know how hard it is to get a hundred thousand dollars? You know how hard it is, right? I had to just that we ate that. It's sick to my stomach. I can't be bitter. But what what was produced in us. Through that is something beautiful. The, 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 the amount of faith that God has given me, the amount of favor, when this past Sunday, when the building is overfilled, we're at 120% capacity. How awesome is that? We've had 81 baptized this year, 60 filled with the Holy Ghost. Come on. <laughs> Hard things are the Lord's things. Hard things Hardened me. They prepared me. Job had tenacious faith. His wife said, dost thou still retain thine integrity? Curse God and die. Now, that's a hard thing, Sha, for your wife to say that. If you are a Christian, you are going to be called to do hard things. Heaven is going to be populated with people who did hard things. In Matthew 7, Jesus said, straight is the gate and narrows the way, and few there be that find it. I'm skipping a couple verses there. It's, it's, it's a straight. That means it's restricted. It, they're, they're, it's very na- few. Why are there few people that find it? Because few people will volunteer to do hard things. I need someone to grab a shovel and dig out the ditch in the front yard. I also need someone to sit in this building and make sure the air conditioner is cooling to 65 degrees. I can verify the thermostat, Pastor. There'll be, there won't be a line for the, for the shovel. See, to do hard things, you're going to have to embrace grace. Grace is much more than unmerited favor. Grace is a gorilla. (laughs) 
I preached a message about a gorilla named Grace. I'm convinced that grace is not some wonderfully kind, soft, affectionate attribute of God, which he dispenses his favor upon his people. I believe that grace is a big, hairy gorilla. How? Just ah, this, this big monster, this big, big, gray-haired gorilla. Ah, grace is this massively strong, spiritually scary entity which causes hell to tremble and sinners to stand with confidence before men as well as with God. The gorilla named grace is what fills in the gap for every human. You have to understand what grace is. Grace is everything you're not. I'm, we're saved by grace. Nobody's good enough, it's grace. It's, it's, it's just the grace of God. In fact, it's Paul that said, I, I had all this happen. Three times I sought the Lord, deliver me, and, and God says, my grace is sufficient. The grace of God is what filled in the gap for all of Paul's shortcomings. You're never going to be good enough. You're never going to be righteous enough. You're never going to be whole enough. You're going to be saved by grace through faith. Can I have an amen? But understanding grace is extremely important because it is grace that you're going to need to get through some things. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Skip to verse 3. Thou therefore endure hardness. Until you understand grace, you're going to have a hard time with hard times. God, I just need some grace to get through this. Okay, so I failed. I got mad. I even dropped a cuss word. You think I'm quitting over that? I'm repenting over my cuss word. I'm not going to hell over a cuss word. I am not. I'm not going to hell over somebody who said something ugly to me and I said something ugly back to them. I'm going to apologize and repent and get right with God. I'm not going to hell over uh, whatever you can think of. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I understand grace. And if I can grasp grace, I can endure hardness. Often hard things are the Lord's things. They're things that he's asking us to do. There's an old expression that says, if you live for God hard, it's easy. If you live for God easy, it's hard. That's why in that first year, you need to commit. I'm going to pray every day. I'm going to read the Bible every day. I'm going to fast every week. I'm going to go to church faithfully. If you'll, you're living for God hard. I'm doing it hard. Hard. Not easy. Hard. Then it becomes easy. If you go hard in your finances, you automatically learn how to live off of 70% of your income. You automatically pay your tithes, give some offering, put some money in savings, put some money invested, put away 30%. You get 1000 bucks. you're living off of 700 you got 300 put up, boom, you're good. And then next year, whenever you start making 1200 a week, you still live like you're making 1000 a week, and you live off of 700 now you can put 500 up. Then when hard time comes, people are like, my God, you never even broke six figures. You're like, didn't need to. I'm a millionaire now because since I was in my early 20s, I began putting up. That's exactly how it works. But who does that? Very few. Why? Because we don't like doing hard things. See, hard things are the Lord's things. And God already has a plan for you. you got to embrace doing the hard things. And 2 Peter, nope, I'm not going to go there. Let me, let me try to, too much, too much, too much. Oh, Jesus, eat my flesh, drink my blood, right? Remember him saying that in John chapter 6? In John 6 and 60, many therefore of his disciples, when they heard this, they said, this is a hard saying, who can hear it? This is hard. What do you mean, eat my flesh, drink my blood? From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Don't quit because it's hard, and don't quit because you don't understand. Don't quit when he asks you something to do, to do something that either you don't like or agree with. And don't quit when others who follow him are turning away. Well, you know what? They left. I'm, I may not stay here. Are you kidding me? I don't care. Y'all can all leave. I'm staying. I mean it. My wife and kids backslide. What I'm telling you, I'm going to heaven. This has to be that personal. There's a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end of are the ways of this. You know what the way is? It's the easy way. That's the way that seems right to a man. It's the constant search for the path of least resistance. That's why at the beginning of your Christianity, Jesus said, if any man will come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. It starts with denying yourself. The very first thing he asks you to do is a hard thing. Tell yourself no. Tell yourself no when you feel tired on Sunday morning because you stayed up all night doing whatever. Get your hide out of bed and get to church. Fall asleep on the pew, fine, but get here. Come to church in your work clothes, get here. Keep your fast day. Read your Bible. Go to church. Live for God. Do the hard things.
Jesus asked us to do hard things all over the scriptures. He said, you think I come to send peace on the earth? I came not to send peace, but a sword, Matthew 10, 34. I come to set a man at variance against his father, a daughter against her mother. He says it. If you bring me into your life, I could bring division into your family. So Satan says, this can't be God. Your parents are all against you. Uh, no, in fact, that very well means the evidence that this is God. That was the evidence for me. My family turning on me. They didn't embrace this. My mother didn't embrace this. She made me get on my knees and swear to God I would not go back to this cult. I had to overcome disobeying and dishonoring my mother to be saved. You, you follow that? And that's why he said, if, except you hate your mother or father, you can't follow me. He's not asking you to hate. He's asking you to be able to disobey in effect that is hate because love is obedience. If you can't follow that logic, you can meet me after service. I'll explain a little better. Hard things are the Lord's things. It's, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. They were sons of who can be saved. Jesus said, with men it is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible. All things are hard things. When we have two services, this is going to be a hard thing, but it's a Lord thing, the Lord's thing. Think about this. Think of all the opportunities there are going to be. We're going to have the capacity to reach more people. Is this not what we're here for? To preach the gospel, practice the gospel, and have phenomenal church. Isn't that our mission statement? Woo! We won't huck a buck and shout and Holy Ghost church. Isn't that what we, that's what we're about, isn't it? Well, I'll be honest with you, me likes that. But that's not the purpose. It's to preach, to practice, and produce disciples. And at this point in the history of our church, our building is our limiting factor. But it doesn't have to be. In fact, this gives us a tremendous opportunity because now there's going to be more opportunities for you to serve. I wish I could do something. Really? Really? When you nursery workers, oh, 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 glitch in the matrix, oh, 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 oh. I'm looking for a place to serve. We need van drivers. Oh, oh, I thought I want to do ministry. Well, uh, Mela, you see, this is ministry. Driving a van, picking up kids in your own car. Are they going to mess up my car? No, just put a sheet or a towel in your back seat. That's exactly what I did. When Paul and I got married, we began bus ministry. I had a goal to break the number that was the history, uh, the record of our church. The number was 269. And so I had a, we had a goal to break the number 269. And I told the Lord, if you give me a new car, I'll use it for your kingdom. We bought a 1989 Acura Integra, brand new. And we picked up, we'd pick up six, eight kids. So what I did, because I didn't want them to put suckers and stuff all in my back seat. So I just wrapped my back seat with a sheet or towels and make sure they didn't stain my seats. But I brought them in that brand new car. I'm just telling you. And we broke the record. We did this back in 1988-89. The church didn't keep that number, but we did break the record. It, it gives you more places to serve. No one has to miss church because they're teaching children. Whenever those two, that two-story building is, we're going to have Sunday school classes, all kind of stuff. You don't have to miss the main service because you can worship in one and work the other. You can serve in one and be served in the other. I need some smile and faces going, we're with you, Pastor. Keep brainwashing us. We're just going to do what you said. Uh, uh. <laughs> Doubling is a hard thing. We want to double, right? Elijah asked Elisha for a double portion. He said, what you've asked is a hard thing. I'm in 2 Kings 2 and 10. Doubling is a hard thing. Nevertheless, if thou see me when I'm taken, keep your eye on the man of God. Now, this sounds a little self-serving, but I'm telling you, I'm doing my best to follow the leading of the Spirit of God. I'm not a perfect man, but I love the Lord. I do, and I love you. I do pray. My wife can tell you I'm moral. I, I'm committed. I love my family. I love God. If you will keep your eye on the man of God, if you will pray for me and let God give me the vision and you follow, I'm telling you there is no end to what he will do here. <laughs> Elijah told Elisha, what you've asked, you want a doubling, you want double, it's a hard thing, but you keep your eye on me. And if you see me when I'm taken up, it's going to happen. Elisha had to keep his eye on the man of God. He couldn't be distracted. I don't care who's saying what. Yeah, yeah, Elijah thinks he's all that. I don't care what you're saying, bro. That's the man of God. That's who God put in my life. There are people who have made sacrifices to stay in this church who have passed up opportunities, more money, all kind of stuff, because they just feel like this is where God called them. I'm telling you, you will not regret that in eternity. 
You may have friends who say, well, I got a bigger house. Who cares? Your kids don't care what size house you have. They really don't. They'd rather have a, a present parent than a parent who brings a bunch of presents. That's a good line. I should have had that up there. He wants to do large things through you. Why do we do hard things? Because he wants to do large things in you and through you. Large things are hard things, and large things are the Lord's things. So there's two of the hardest things we can do. I know I'm rushing for time. Let me finish. Two of the hardest things to do. Number one, one of the hardest things to do. This is one of the hardest things to do. Nothing. God, that is absolutely. Because you want <laughs> Vengeance is mine, Seth. Oh, boy, I'm so glad because I want to get him. I, they stole. I had to give that dude $15,000. You talk about a bitter pill. Ooh, 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 ooh. Ooh, for what? Two more layers of sheetrock on that back wall. That was $22,000. After we already had it, spent $60,000 on a sprinkler system because a local water district wouldn't give us water. Just refused to. Nothing you can do about it. They just said no. Okay. So then I got to spend $22,000 in those four doors. Well, those aren't fire rated doors. I got to replace those doors. That was $7,000 more. You, you, you following this? $60,000 in that, $22,000 in there, $7,000. And then I got a fire hydrant in the front that isn't even connected. Oh, God. You talk about hurt. It's a hard thing, but it was the Lord's thing. There are things that are in Paula and I. That would not have gotten there without that painful, the level of patience and love and grace that God has given me is because we went through some hard things. Doing nothing was very hard. Just trusting God. I'll tell you what happened. Uh, we had a hurricane come through. We got about $120,000, $140,000 uh, of insurance money. And we paid around $30,000 fixing some of the things. And then we banked the other and I kept that money to go towards our next phase. So whenever we got those monies, I'm like, we're whole. In my mind, that's God paying us back for what was lost at the beginning. That's how I view that. I ascribe that to the Lord. And if I never got it, well, then that's, that's that. Whatever. It's lost. What do you do? Cry? Die? No. Oh, no. Okay, doing nothing is hard. That's why Moses said, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. In verse 14 of Exodus, he said, the Lord shall fight for you and ye shall hold your peace. You need to hold your peace and let God do the fighting. Don't go after them. Don't fix it. You just trust the Lord. And the second hardest thing in the world to do is just to stay. To do nothing is difficult and staying. Stay in church. Stay in your marriage. Stay. Sometimes the easiest thing in the, is the path of least resistance. David was fleeing from Saul, hit himself, he, and he said this. He said, uh, ver, Psalms 55 and 6, oh, that I had wings like a dove, then would I fly away. He was in a village, he was in a, a mountain range called Ziph, and the Ziphites in the village went and told Saul, hey, the man you're looking for, David, he's right over here in our town. Can you imagine? Man, when I be, if I was David, I'd become king. I'm wiping out the Ziphites. Not David. David went through some hard things. And God did some large things in him through these hard things. You're not the only person who wants to run away. Okay, let me wrap this up. In Jesus' name. I'm going to skip all that. Revelation 21 and 21, the very last verse. And the 12 gates were, of tw were 12 pearls. Every several gate was of one pearl. There are not pearly gates in heaven. According to this verse, there are 12 gates, and each gate is made of one pearl. Pearls. The way a pearl is made, an oyster, a clam, has in it a muscle. And when an, a single granule of sand or some sort gets inside, the clam, the oyster, secretes something called nacre, N-A-C-R-E, nacre. And, and so the, the clam, the oyster, it, it, it secretes the nacre, and the nacre coats this little grain of sand. And, 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 it, and it smooths the rough edges, and, and then it secretes another layer of nacre, and it coats it, and it just keeps doing this. 
And, and really all a pearl is, is the evidence of an organism that overcame an irritant, an offense. To get into heaven, the people that get into heaven are people who figured out how to overcome large irritants and offenses. There's a reason you've gone through some hard things. Because the gates are made each of one giant pearl. It was the hand of God. You're going to thank God for those hard things. You're going to thank him. Were it not, were it not for this, had, had I not gone through this in my marriage, in our finances, with my kids, with the city, with the government, with the organization, with my employer, whatever your thraka is. Thraka is Greek for thraka. In Jesus' name. Father, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for loving us and for giving us the beauty of your word. It is the source of life. It is a source of inspiration. May your word reach its mark tonight. Thank you for ministering to homes, to families, to our youth. We thank you, God, for having a perfect will toward us. We want to walk in that will. I speak blessings over your people today in Jesus' name. And everyone said amen. amen. Clap your hands to the Lord. I love you. We will see you Sunday morning, 1030. Leadership Workshop, Saturday, 9 a.m.